I would have made a great Pharisee. I'm just telling you, I would have made a great Pharisee. I was born and raised in a very devout Christian home. I have no conscious memory in all of my life that is not connected to church as the center of life. I don't have any conscious memory of any time of great rebellion against my parents or against God. I don't have any conscious memory of skipping out on church. If the church doors were open, the Kellys were there. I started getting Bibles when I was a baby and I kept getting Bibles all of my life. Every Bible changing as I changed and grew older. We memorized Bible verses. We quoted Bible verses in family gatherings. My job at Christmas every year was to quote the Christmas story from Luke chapter two. I would have been a great Pharisee. How great? I grew up in a large family four sisters, no brothers, even our dog was a girl. I had no chance at all growing up. And it was a wonderful day when I was about 10 or 11 years old when a family with five boys moved in next door. Wow, what a great day that was. They were a Catholic family. They were very different than we were. Who cared? They had five boys. The oldest was Sam. The one my age was Mike, and we did a lot of stuff once they came. I was so overjoyed and excited to have some male companionship. Well, one day the oldest, Sam, took off on his bicycle, and we were all chasing. We gathered together, and there were about six or seven, another kid or two in the neighborhood, and I was there, and about half of the Messina brothers were there, and uh, I lived in a really neat neighborhood where you could you didn't have to ride your bike very far to be in little hills and patches of woods and things like that and feel very isolated. And we got to a spot, everybody jumped off their bikes and Sam had brought along a pack of cigarettes and we were going to smoke cigarettes. And I had never smoked a cigarette before and I, that sounded like it was gonna be exciting to do. And they started passing out cigarettes and Sam said, oh, sorry, Chuck, you can't do this. It's not you. We're leaving. Jumped on his bike and rode off with the cigarettes fast as I could keep up with them. Even the lost people around me were protecting me from doing bad things. I would have been, yes, Russell. All right, let's all head to one of two places. Men's room, ladies room, right back here. If not there, the hallway right behind the chapel also has no glass or windows. One of those two places as quickly as you can, please. We will give you an all clear. Thank you. All right, we're good to go. Now, uh, so far today, number one, we've discovered chapel is not always boring. Do I have an amen for that? Uh, also, the second thing that we've discovered is that Dr. Jonathan Key doesn't really pay attention in chapel. Uh, he, he told me while we were back there in the hall waiting, he said, well, so far the main thing I have uh, from chapel is that you said you were a Pharisee. I said, no, no. <laughs> You weren't listening. I said, I would have made a good Pharisee. Now, what that has taught me is that whenever I'm reading the New Testament and I'm in a scene in the life of Jesus and there are Pharisees in that scene, I need to really pay attention because I'm more like them than anybody else in that scene. I, I'm more like them than Jesus, certainly. I'm more like them even then the disciples, I, I am usually more like a Pharisee than anybody else in the scene. And so I get to Luke chapter 15 and we have this amazing chapter of the Bible. I think it would be on any Bible student's list of great Bible chapters. And it opens by saying, now all the tax gatherers and sinners were gathering near Jesus to listen to him. And the Pharisees, that would be me, and the scribes, began to grumble saying, this man receives sinners and he even eats with them. They were disappointed. They were upset. They were a bit insulted for the sake of God that someone who was in effect a rabbi 
would be dealing with the kind of people who were gathered around him. Not the only time that happened in the life of Jesus, both the gathering of tax collectors and sinners and the criticism of Pharisees and others who saw Jesus mixing with these kind of people. Jesus heard that. So many times people voice their criticisms just softly enough to be certain you hear and know what they are saying. He heard that comment and his response was very intriguing. He told three parables. The parable of the lost sheep, a shepherd who had 99 sheep that were safe and well, one that was lost and the shepherd desperately went searching for the one that was lost until he found it, closes that parable by saying, I tell you there's more joy in heaven over one unrighteous person who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. The story of a woman who lost a silver coin. Silver coin could not be found. Tore up her household looking for that coin until she found it. And when she found it, she threw a party. Can you imagine throwing a party for a coin? Now that's a woman determined to have a good time. Okay. More joy in heaven over one of the lost who repents than over 99 who need no repentance. And the prodigal son, who so profoundly, deeply, personally insulted his father, wanted his inheritance, basically said to his dad, I wish you were dead since you haven't done me the courtesy of dying by now. Please just give me the money I'm going to get after you die in advance, and I will be happy and well and good. Can't even imagine a father's heart when he hears that from a son, especially in the Jewish culture. Loses everything desperate conditions, finally realizes the, the worst person in standing in his father's home had far more to eat, had far safer conditions than he did. And he makes that incredibly difficult decision to arise and go home. That incredible reunion of the father with the son the son has his prepared speech, his whole journey home. He spent preparing the speech to ask for his father's forgiveness. Does not even want to be recognized as son. Just ask if he can be a household servant. He used his whole journey to practice that speech, but his father would not even let him finish. Immediately did all the things to affirm him as son. Lost sheep found. Lost coin found lost son found restored well now we're ready to the point of all three remember what set this story in motion what set this story in motion was the disdain the shock the disappointment the frustration the annoyance on the part of the Pharisees and scribes that someone like Jesus a man of God would mix and mingle with people like that. What is the mission? That's a simple question, but it has profound implications in, in how the answer unfolds. What is the mission to which you have been called? What is the mission that you are on for God? The Pharisees had a very clear sense of mission, and that mission was to be righteous. Now who wants to argue with that? Anybody here think God doesn't want you to be righteous? The mission was to be righteous. That was not so much wrong as it was incomplete. You need to eat to live. Is that a true statement? Well, yeah, but it's incomplete. You have to breathe too. You can eat all you want, but if you're not taking in oxygen, you will die. You cannot live only by eating. To say that you have to eat to live, it, it's not that it's false, it's just incomplete. And to understand a sense of mission, to be righteous. Now remember, these, these people, they dedicated their lives to studying the Word of God. That's me. 
They dedicated their lives to not simply studying it, memorizing it, learning it word for word. Me. They dedicated their lives not simply to knowing God's word, but to obedience to God's word. Me. Dedicated their lives not only to studying the word of God, learning the word of God, doing the word of God, emphasizing obedience, but to teaching other people to know and do the word of God. Me. But the mission, the mission is redemption for everyone who needs it. Now, let me say that again. The mission is redemption for everyone who needs it. And in their zeal for righteousness, in their zeal for the word of God, in their zeal for obedience, in their zeal to honor God and lift up his word and teach his word and live holy lives, in their zeal for God's word and obedience, they overlooked God's passion to forgive. And do you know what was missing in the life of a Pharisee? Tension. Tension. The lost sheep and the shepherd. In the soul of the shepherd, there was tension. He had to find that. He was just gripped. He was moved. He could not stop until he found that sheep. He knew he had to find. It was his responsibility. It was something he had to do. The life of that sheep was at stake. He had to find that sheep. And there was a real tension in his soul driving him to search until he found that sheep that was lost. In the life of that woman, there was tension in her soul. There was tension. That was her money. That money was useless. It didn't matter how big that coin was. It was now completely useless. It might as well not exist. You couldn't spend it. You couldn't put it on a balance sheet. It was absolutely useless. You could do nothing with it. And she had that tension in her soul until she found that coin. Tension. In that family. There was tension developing in the soul of the prodigal son as he realized he had made a terrible choice and he wondered if it was too late to go back home. And there was that ever-growing tension, what in the world have I done? How in the world did I end up in a worse position than a pig? Can you imagine a Jewish Boy, concluding he was in a worse position than a pig. Tension in his heart over the terrible choices he had made. Tension in the father's heart, longing for a restoration with that son. And as soon as he sees, you see that tension instantly resolve in the love of the father for that son. No questions asked. Forgiveness, acceptance, restoration. And the elder brother, it's the last thing in the chapter. All the chapter is building, all three of those stories building to the elder brother. And the elder brother is the only person in that story without any tension collect, connected to the lost. Now let me say that again. The only person in the story without any tension connected to the lost. He came in from the field, saw the gathering feast, found out it was because his brother had come home in absolutely no sense of joy or satisfaction. You know, right away, there was never a thought in that brother's mind to go looking for his brother who ran away from home to find him. Never thought about that. Didn't care if he was alive or dead. No tension whatsoever. And he could not understand the father's heart because there was no longing, no tension in his soul for redemption to happen. Oh, boy. 
this is not good. I could have been a really good Pharisee and given my life to the work of God. But if I forget, the mission is redemption of everyone who needs it. I miss everything. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Let me bury an idea and not praise it. We cannot be healthy as the people of God. We cannot be healthy as a church of the Lord Jesus if there is not a tension in our souls driving us to seek those who are lost and bring them home. To seek those who are outside the kingdom and bring them back for restoration with the Father. And today, the greatest problem we have in Southern Baptist life with a 16-year plunge in our baptisms, every year lower than the year before, is that we're getting perfectly happy doing church if we can just do music that we like and not kill each other over the songs we sing. We consider that a great victory in a happy church. If we can just pay all of our bills, if we could just get along with each other, if we can just stay awake during our pastors, interesting enough to at least keep us awake on Sundays, we consider this to be marks of a great church. If we can just get together an offering for the IMB and what we have lost is a sense of tension over the lack of impact we are making on the people in our communities who need redemption. And this was the word of Jesus to those Pharisees. So much of your life passionate about the things of God, but you forget redemption is the mission. So I close by asking you this simple question. Are you like the shepherd? Driven? Looking for people who are lost? Are you, are you searching for anyone? If not, why not? Are you like the woman searching for a lost coin? Do do you have that sense of drive looking for a person that's not in your life right now? For someone who's not in the church? Do do, do you have that drive for those who are outside? If not, why not? Are you like the father who's desperately longing for a boy who made terrible choices to come home? Or are you like the elder brother You're just doing life. And there's no tension in your heart. The mission is more than being righteous. The mission is redemption for everybody who needs it. And we are not truly like Jesus unless we are being driven unless there is a tension in our souls to reach the people who are not here, the people in our communities. Father, thank you so very much for your incredible way of teaching. And I come before you just embarrassed, Father, at how much like a Pharisee I am and how easy it is to be caught up in doing these good things, studying your word, praying, seeking to live a holy, obedient life. These are necessary good things, things that you desire your children to do. But Father, I pray 
that you would give me in my soul what is in your soul, and that is a tension, longing for those who are not here to be found, for those who have made bad choices to be restored, a tension for redemption of all the people around me. In the precious name of Jesus, whose tension led him to the cross and brought me home. In his name, I pray. And in his name, I ask you to help me look more like him. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And thank you for being a part of our most unusual chapel service ever. God bless you.